Good morning and welcome to Bridgewater Church Online. Thanks for spending some screen time with us. As we begin, we invite you to participate with us for worship, whatever space you are in. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for being with us today as we worship and come together and celebrate all the love you have given us. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome to Bridgewater Church Online. We're so glad that you found your way here. My name is Liz and I am the children's and young adult pastor here at Bridgewater Church. And I say this every time that I get an opportunity to preach, but I really do mean it that I am so grateful for a chance to be in the pulpit this morning. And I'm going to be real with you, most of the time when I get to do this and get some time to step out of the cove where I hang out with kiddos and be with uh, big church people. 
a topic or a scripture jumps out at me pretty naturally. And maybe the sermon is part of a series and I already know what I'm going to be preaching on. But for whatever reason, that was not the case this time. And I procrastinated getting started, and then I wrestled with if I wanted to start with a specific passage of scripture, or if I wanted to kind of study more topically. And I tried lots of different things. I tried settling into a coffee shop to write for the morning, only to end up people watching instead of actually preparing. Then I landed in a library (laughs) where I thought I'd have great focus space, and there was an actual piano tuner tuning a piano while I was there. And this musician's ear was so distracted listening to him get this piano just in the perfect shape. And then, one morning, finally, I got up really early. I ground and brewed a fresh cup of coffee. I put on some Latin guitar music, which is kind of my, like, focus vibe. I lit a candle, I threw my hair up, and I dove in. And that's, that's when I finally started to get somewhere. It took intention and action that would set me up to get where I needed to be. It took a kind of ritual, the coffee and the music and the calming candle scent to get me in the right headspace. And from there, God quickly used the struggle that I'd been kind of living in for a week to lead me into what I believe that he wants to talk to us about today. And that is this. The world around us is full of distractions. It can be chaotic. It can be cluttered. It can distract us from what's true, and it can cause us to forget the promises of God. But we have the ability to act with intentionality and to set our thoughts and our minds on things that are good and that are right and that are pure. Now this morning, we're going to talk about these practices using the term rituals. We don't use the word ritual a whole lot around here. In fact, sometimes within the Protestant church, the idea of ritual can even have a negative connotation. Maybe you you think about the word or something being ritualistic and think of something that is works-based or that precedes relationship. But I think that we can reclaim this word ritual rather than using a word like routine or practice or habit because there's something sacred in the idea of a ritual. In fact, a ritual is defined as either a series of actions or types of behavior regularly followed by someone, or as a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. Another approach to this concept of routine versus ritual came from an Instagram account that I follow about bullet journaling, which is basically just a way of saying that you're making your your planner fancy. (laughs) Anyway, this post said that whereas the goal of a routine is to make behavior automatic, the goal of a ritual is to make it intentional. Let's, Let's read that one more time. Whereas the goal of a routine is to make a behavior automatic, the goal of a ritual is to make it intentional. So today we're going to look at the rituals, I I heard one pastor recently call them blessed rituals, that we're called to as believers and the intentionality that we are called to live with. We see people all throughout the Bible implementing rituals and living intentionally in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So let's lay a foundation of scripture this morning for where we're headed. In Deuteronomy, we read this command to the Israelites, God's chosen people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This command to the Israelites, to God's chosen people, is all about intention. It's all about consistent behavior, about reciting the words of the Lord in the morning and in the evening. And then in the New Testament, Jesus gives us specific instructions about prayer, about baptism, about communion, even foot washing, that remind us of the important role that ritual continues to play in the lives of believers. Now, rituals aren't secret self-help steps to success. 
And they aren't odd, ancient, mystical practices. They're simply sacred rhythms that we intentionally put into place as we strive to look more like Jesus and to live more like him in this crazy, distracting, chaotic world around us. I believe that when we can set these kind of rhythms in our lives, we're creating an environment that helps us more easily tune our ears to God's voice, to sense those nudges of the Holy Spirit, and to walk more closely with Jesus and with others around us. So I want to invite you this morning to reflect on the rituals in your own life by asking three questions together with me. What rituals are we feigning that we need to get real about? What have we forgotten that rituals can help us to remember? And finally, what rituals will we forge in the future? This first question comes out of Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, where we find Jesus sharing with his disciples, and he says this, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and to pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. But truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. And then Jesus goes on to teach the disciples that beautiful example of the Lord's Prayer. He shows them one of the ways he models for them a way that they can pray to the Father. Can you imagine being one of the disciples in a moment like this? Jesus is speaking about all of these religious rituals that have been requirements in the Jewish tradition that you are a part of. But instead of simply praising the practice, he gets at the intention behind the action and he asks for something deeper something that's truly sacred. He calls out those who are feigning the ritual, simply going through the motions because it's what's expected or it's what receives the most human praise. And Jesus is asking the disciples to get real about these rituals. And I think he's asking the same of us today. So what rituals are we feigning that we need to get real about? To feign means to pretend to be affected by something. We've all seen a toddler that after taking some minor tumble looks all around the room to wait for the attention of the adults before bursting into dramatic tears. They're feigning the impact of the fall for the attention of the caregivers. Or maybe it's not a toddler. Maybe it's the professional basketball star feigning an injury in the effort to persuade the ref of a foul play. These are physical examples images of the kind of ritual that Jesus is warning against here in this passage. I love the way that the message version says it, so if you wouldn't mind, let me read that version for you. Be especially careful when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. Playing to the crowd. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it quietly and unobtrusively. That is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for 15 minutes of fame. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is so full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant, and they're full of formulas and programs and advice peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. What rituals are we feigning that we need to get real about? 
What performances are we putting on for the sake of others rather than God? These things can get sneaky because we have to take the time to honestly examine the motivations of our hearts. Are you sharing that Christian Facebook post out of a desire to truly impact and encourage someone? Or is it more to show others that you're the kind of person who posts those kinds of things? Does the gift that God's calling you to give someone need to have your name on the card? Or is he asking you to keep your left hand from knowing what your right hand is doing? Does your prayer time allow for silence and stillness before God? Or has it become more about the requirement than an intentional ritual time with God? Friends, it's time to get real about these things to bravely examine the state of our hearts and minds and make sure that we're not simply pretending to be affected by the rituals that God has called us to, but that we take a posture that truly allows for God to affect us in transformational, incredible ways. I read this old story that maybe you've heard before. It's told about a rabbi who, whenever he wanted to intentionally get in the presence of God, he went to this special place in the woods and he lit a fire And he said a prayer, and he did a dance. And then God would appear to him. And when he died, one of his disciples did the same thing. If he wanted to be in the presence of God, he went to the same spot in the woods. He lit the fire. He said the same prayers, but no one had taught him the dance moves. But it still worked. God was present and appeared to him. Now, when that disciple died, he had his own pupil that carried on this tradition. And when he wanted to be in God's presence, what did he do? He went to the same spot in the woods, and he lit the fire, but he didn't know the prayers or the dance, and God still appeared. And then, you can probably predict how the story goes, that disciple died, and he had another student of his. And whenever he wanted to be in God's presence, he also went to the same place in the woods, but nobody had taught him how to light a fire, or how to pray the prayer, or how to do the dance. And God was still present with him. And lastly, when that pupil died, his own student wanted to be in God's presence. And so he searched for the place in the woods, but he couldn't even find that. And he didn't know how to light the fire or say the prayers or do the dance. All he knew was how to tell the story of these rabbis who had gone before him. But it worked. He discovered that whenever he told the story of how the others had found God, those who had gone before him, that God was still present and that he appeared. Now, the the idea here of this story is, is not about those actions themselves. It's not about the exact words of the prayer. It's not about the exact moves of the feet in the dance. It's that despite the fact that even this youngest student couldn't recall any step of the original practice, he showed up seeking the presence of God, and God was present with him. When we authentically and intentionally seek God, remembering that he's shown up in amazing ways in the past, we will experience his presence in new ways in our lives. Now, this story of this rabbi and his disciples leads us to the second question that we want to ask ourselves this morning. While God's actions and presence weren't determined by the specific actions of the rabbi or his pupils, there is still a gap, right, in the teaching and in the remembrance in that story. The psalmist models remembrance in Psalms chapter 77, verses 11 through 12, when they write, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. One of the primary intentions of many of the rituals that we see in Scripture are for the sake of remembering what God has done. We often see the Hebrew people building altars to the Lord in places where something miraculous has happened so that any time that they go past that same place, they can stop and they can remember and recall what God has done. And in the New Testament, Jesus asks the believers to participate in certain rituals, rituals that we call sometimes sacraments or ordinances, and we still participate in them today. And those rituals set aside special time to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus and to celebrate and practice how Jesus taught us to live. When I was uh, a teenager, my family traveled to Tampa, Florida to celebrate my cousin Michael's bar mitzvah. And a bar mitzvah recognizes the age when a Jewish boy, it's a, it's a bat mitzvah for girls, 
when a Jewish boy becomes accountable for his actions and they're welcomed into the Jewish community as adults. And for, for boys, that is at the age of 13. And I was amazed at all of the ritual that I experienced there. My cousin Michael had memorized lengthy passages of the Torah, and the ceremony itself lasted for several hours and was predominantly in Hebrew. Despite my lack of language comprehension, you could sense how important of a moment and of a transition this ceremony was. It took seriously the commands given in their scriptures, and it recalled the things that God had done for their people. It was a reminder of those who had walked before him and of the tradition that he was entering into. It was intentional. It was beautiful. It was sacred. And when all of those specific tasks had been completed, woe did we celebrate. We celebrated the dedication and the discipline that Michael had put in. We celebrated the way the community had come around him and welcomed him into adulthood. And we celebrated how good the food was. Rituals are tools of remembrance. And remembrance of what God has done in our lives not only helps other people experience him in new ways, but it also brings peace and solid ground in times when the hand of God on our lives is harder to sense. So our question is this. What have we forgotten that ritual can help us to remember? What has God done in your life that you intentionally want to recall? If you're a believer, do you remember the date that you accepted Christ? Or maybe God has delivered you from an addiction and you celebrate that freedom in recognizing years of sobriety. Maybe you or someone you know was healed from an illness and every year they remember the date that they found out that they were in remission and they celebrate what God has done. Implementing ritual to help us remember what God has done. It doesn't have to involve a whole ceremony or, or a creation of a brand new holiday. Most of us already have rituals in our lives that we could creatively shift the focus of. One of my favorite times with my group of friends is when we're celebrating a birthday. Like you, we typically go to dinner somewhere and I eagerly anticipate the moment when I can jump in with my favorite wi ritual, birthday questions. At this point, birthday questions have become ritual enough that none of my friends are surprised by this. And I like to ask four things. Number one, what are you most proud of from the last year of your life? Number two, what has been your biggest challenge this past year? Number three, what has God taught you about himself this year? And number four, what are you the most hopeful for in this next year of your life? If any of you have a birthday today or soon, you can answer those questions. Birthday questions are the best. Now, it's good to remember through these questions where you've been, what you've overcome, and where God is leading you next. And then we spend time together praying over the birthday person and speaking encouraging things over them. Now, birthdays are not new, but it's a ritual that we can step intentionally into and implement behavior that brings meaning. Weddings, anniversaries, baby dedications, even heavy and difficult moments like the funeral of a loved one are opportunities for rituals that help us to remember what God has done and is doing in our lives. What rituals already exist in your world that you can harness more intentionally? If, if you have a unique way that you and your family or friends remember or celebrate through ritual, share it with us. Here online, let's talk about it in the comments and help each other really put these things into practice as a community. Because as we participate in ritual together, we're laying foundations for those who will come after us. And we're showing the world around us reminders of the transformation that God has done in our lives. And these things take commitment and regularity and an expectation that it is leading us to something beyond the action or the present or the celebration itself. Rituals are important for remembering in the present, but they are equally impactful on the way that we live in the days that follow. This leads us to our final question of the morning. What rituals are we forging for the future? We've talked about what it looks like to follow Jesus' instructions about being authentic in our behaviors and our rituals, not just feigning them. We've looked at how ritual can bring forgotten things into remembrance and into celebration. But now, we're going to get practical about how you and I can actually forge rituals for the future. To forge means to make or shape maybe like a metal object by heating it in a fire or furnace and beating or hammering it. Or 
to create a relationship or new conditions, to build, to construct, to establish, to set up. When we forge a new ritual, we're creating new conditions and quite possibly new depths of relationships. We're actively seeking repetition that refines us and that draws us closer to God. I think back to the verse in Deuteronomy that reminded us to remember God's word in the morning and the evening, to put it in places where we will repeatedly encounter it. I think about Jesus regularly taking time to go off alone in a ritual of communication with the Father of prayer. I also think of stories like like the lame man in Acts 3, who ritually lay at the temple gates daily, and he asked for money as people came to the temple. And of Peter and John, who were ritually going to the temple when they encountered this man. If you aren't familiar with this story, the two disciples are walking into the temple, and the lame man cries out asking for money. And Peter turns to him, and he says this, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And this man, he picks up his mat, and he walks. He's done the same thing every day of his life, and his expectations were simply that he might be given enough to survive. But Peter and John were forging rituals and lifestyles of an expectation of what God could do. They let the ritual, they didn't let the ritual of going to the temple become a mindless habit. They stayed attuned to the will of God, and a man's life was changed forever. Maybe for you, this this question. An answer isn't as much about forming a brand new ritual, but about leaning into current ritual with a greater understanding and expectation. Ritual for the sake of ritual is not ritual. It's habit. I'm not saying that good habits can't be productive and healthy, but doing the action is the point of the habit. With ritual, the point is where you're headed. It's the expectation of what is connecting to and leading to. Ritual is about the crafting and the forging. I was struck by this quote in the Harvard Business Review's Guide to Managing Stress. It says this, By fostering deceptively simple rituals that will help you regularly replenish your energy, you can strengthen your physical, emotional, and mental resilience. These rituals include taking brief breaks at specific intervals, expressing appreciation to others, reducing interruptions, and spending more time on the activities you do best and enjoy the most. Now, I would add to that physical, emotional, and mental resilience a spiritual strength. If the secular world recognizes the impact of simple ritual, even when it's lacking in sacred intention, how much more can we anticipate when we set our intentions on the things of God? Let's use our last few minutes together to look at some simple rituals that can be implemented or reimagined in family and in friendships and in faith. Whether you're single or empty nesters or you have a house full of toddler toys and tantrums, family ritual has played a role in your life. When I reflect on some of the most meaningful moments in my family growing up, I often think about times around the table together. Family mealtimes create a great space for ritual to be forged. What would it look like to be more intentional with that time? What does prayer before that meal look like? Has it become habit? Or is there a creative way that you can use that time for remembrance and for celebration? We have small group time here with our kiddos in the cove, all the way from preschoolers up through sixth graders. And one of my favorite things about that small group time that has become a ritual for us, it's always a time on Sunday mornings that we come together. And one of my favorite things is going around the circle and asking each kiddo to tell us about one joy and one challenge from their week. One joy and one challenge. It's a simple ritual, but it connects us to each other. Maybe you spend some discussion like that during your dinner time or on a date night. Or in the few moments you have when the kids storm in to grab an after-school snack. Or maybe it's something you implement as a new component to the family bedtime routine. Simple rituals create big connections and foundations for the future. Think about some of the consistent moments that already exist. And then let's harness them with the power of intentional ritual that leads to closeness with God and with others.
This idea is true for friendships as well. I heard a man sharing once about a lifelong friendship that he valued immensely, and someone who was listening piped in and mentioned how hard they felt like it was to maintain adult, lasting friendships. And the man responded with, nah, we just put a ritual in place. We have lunch once a month, and at the end of the lunch, we get out our calendars and we plan the next lunch. Now, as basic as that sounds, the intentionality of setting up the next time together consistently forged a deeper relationship. Reflect on the friendships that God has given you. How could ritual deepen those relationships and lead you into deeper relationship with God, too? Maybe even ask God to specifically bring someone to mind who you can intentionally pray for and invest in. If it's someone who hasn't been to church in a while, maybe you can invite them to join you. You could share a link to a Devo or to a message that you think might encourage them. Sometimes these things might seem minor or trivial, but ritual is not about the action itself, but about forging greater things. Let's forge rituals that lead to deep, blessed friendships that sharpen and encourage us in our walks with God. The final type of ritual that we're going to lean into this morning are rituals of our faith. Now, you may have heard them called sacraments or ordinances, and they're practices in the life of the community of believers that symbolize and remember what Jesus has done for us and has called us to. For our church, the sacraments that we participate in come directly from Scripture, and they're forged together as a community. Are you thinking now even about what those might be? There are three that we regularly participate in here at Bridgewater, and those are baptism, foot washing. Anybody know the third? Throw it in the comments. And the third is communion. Now, baptism symbolizes the experience of being cleansed from and dying to sin. And it testifies of the new life experienced in the resurrection of Christ. In fact, Jesus set an example of a, for us of this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. The ritual of baptism is not what literally cleanses us. It's a symbol of the grace that God has given. And when we participate in it publicly, we're sharing about the transformation that God has done in our lives. Baptism is a time of celebration in our community. We do it during worship right up here behind me in our baptismal pool, and we get to celebrate together. If baptism is something that you've been thinking about participating in, please reach out to an online host or leave us a message, and a pastor will connect with you soon because we would love to be a part of remembering what God has done and celebrating transformation with you in this way. The second ritual that we participate in here at BWC may seem a little less familiar to you, and, and if it's not something you've ever heard of, it might even seem a little bit odd, and it's the ritual of foot washing. Again, we see Jesus model this for us. In John chapter 13, Jesus has just washed the feet of his followers, of his disciples, even knowing that one of them would quickly betray him. And he says this, So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. We participate here in foot washing each year on Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter, in remembrance of what Jesus did for us and as a ritual that forges humility and kindness and a servant-hearted posture before God and before others. And lastly, this morning, we're going to have an opportunity to actually participate in ritual together. The final sacrament that we're looking at is the ritual of communion or of the Lord's Supper. And the practice of communion is given to us directly by Jesus during the Passover meal, which, which was a Jewish ritual that acknowledged the things that God had done when he, when he rescued the Israelites and when he protected them from the angel of death. And during this Passover meal, preceding Jesus' death on the cross, he taught us how to practice communion. Jesus uses the bread and the wine to symbolize his life, and in breaking the bread and drinking the wine or the juice, we are reminded of Christ's body that was broken for us and of Christ's blood that was shed for us. And while you and I aren't face-to-face -face this morning, this is still something 
beautiful that we can participate in together. In the Church of God tradition, we don't believe that there's anything mystical about the elements themselves. And so there at home or wherever you're watching this from, you can simply pause this stream and, and gather a few simple elements that you have on hand. In fact, I was clearing out my junk drawer the other day, and I actually found one of these small communion cups, which was wild. We have these in-house this morning. But if you are at home, you can pause this video and you can gather a piece of bread or a cracker or a small cup of juice that you have on hand, and we'll be right here when you return. Or if you'd like to wait until the whole family is present or until you can gather safely with a few friends, feel free to come right back to this spot in the video. We believe that everyone who proclaims that Jesus is Lord and follows him with their life is a part of the body of Christ and the family of God. And in taking communion together, we get to actively forge remembrance and relationship with God and with each other. Let's go to scripture as we prepare to take communion together this morning. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 24, we read, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat of the bread together. And scripture then goes on to say, In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink of the cup together now. Friends, it's an honor to join in this sacred ritual with each of you. We're going to pray in just a moment, but before we do, if you have questions about what it looks like to live intentionally for God, or if you want to know more about Jesus and about this sacrifice that we remembered and celebrated together just now, we would love to connect with you. Please shoot our online host a message or leave a comment and let us know how we can help. We're in this together. We're forging relationships with each other and with God in meaningful and transformative ways. And we're so glad that you are with us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifices that you've made for us that allow us to come together in love and in freedom and in grace today. God, nurture the seeds that you have planted in us. Show us what it looks like to live more intentionally for you, to authentically lean into and create rituals that bring growth and remembrance and celebration just like you've taught us. God, we ask especially today also that, that you would be with those who are in heavy and difficult seasons. Be with all who were impacted by Hurricane Ida and disasters in recent days. Be with military families who have experienced recent loss and show us how to care and love the refugee, the displaced, and the grieving. God, we know that you are near and we are grateful. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Friends, it's been so sweet to spend some time with you together here online. We love you, and we're so thankful that you've joined us. Until we see each other again, take heart and be transformed.
Bridgewater Church family, my name is Tracy, and we are so glad that you have joined us for worship today. This has been an exciting summer around here, and we hope that you and your family can be a part of all that is going on. So check out this week's Bridgewater Buzz. Life groups will be kicking back off next Sunday, September the 12th, and we have a spot for you. Whether you're looking for an online option, a group that provides childcare, or people in the same phase of life as you, we want to help you find the right fit. Begin thinking now about what that looks like for you and feel free to reach out to tracy at bwch.org if you have any questions. Signups are now available in the lobby. We can't wait to do community with you. Each year we partner with New Path Child and Family Solutions, previously known as St. Joseph's Orphanage, to gather donations for their life skills program. You can find a list of needed items in the lobby or online at bwch.org. 
Items can be brought to the lobby and placed in the designated baskets anytime between now and October the 3rd. Our BWC Valet team will be launching again next Sunday, September the 12th. If you are a senior in need of assistance, a family with young children, or just need a little extra help on a Sunday morning, all you need to do is pull up under the awning and a team member will be there to help you. This also means that several of our front lot spots will be blocked for valet use. All our handicapped spaces will still be available, but please pay special attention as you park that morning. We are so excited to begin providing valet again this season. We wanted to give you a few dates to get on your family's calendar right away. Check it out. During September, our kids are learning about Nehemiah and talking about taking initiative. Bring the whole family at 11 a.m. for safe, fun, Jesus-filled kids programming. Teen families, the race kicks back off on Sunday, September 19th at 6 p.m. This is one of the major highlights of our student year and you won't want to miss it. You can pre-register at bwch.org or when you arrive on the 19th. The registration is $5. Finally, we'll be launching into an exciting new series called Comeback during the month of September. Sunday, September 19th will be a great day to invite your friends to come back and experience the comeback that God has in store for all of us. Be praying now about who God would have you reach out to with a personal invitation. Your comeback is now. Thanks for joining us for worship today. It's a great time to be a part of all God is doing in our community. We hope to see you online and on campus as we continue to pursue him and all he has in store for us this season. We are so blessed to be a part of Bridgewater family with each of you.